First of all, I have typically at these sessions thank the staff of First Presbyterian Church Greenwood for their willingness to sponsor, endorse, encourage, and affirm this nine-part series on the Holocaust. Because this is a hard topic to wrap our minds around. It's painful, it's difficult, but yet the staff agreed with me that this is something we need to do. We need to do it in terms of our relationships with people who are different from us, our relationships with Jews who happen to have a different point of view than we Christians do uh, about Jesus, in the midst of the rise of anti-Semitic behavior in the United States and in the world, it becomes really important to do this. And you can tell already from what happened in California recently with the 10 people who were killed and 10 who were injured in the Chinese Lunar Year killing and shooting that we're going to have to do these kinds of things also in terms of learning about the Asian population which is an increasing percentage of our fellow citizens in the United States of America. So once again, I will say thanks to the staff of First Pres for not only <coughs> endorsing this nine-part series, but also putting some shekels of silver into renting this exhibit, which comes through the courtesy of the University of South Carolina. A couple of persons have said to me, it was good to go through the exhibit because it grounds some of the things that you're saying in personal kinds of situations. And it brings to mind, it brings to, to, to recollection uh, the story of Anna Frank. So if you've not read the diary yet, or you read it a number of years ago, or you just read it a couple years ago, read it again. Read it again. And while I'm expressing thank yous, let me also say thank you to all of you. Because this kind of topic is not easy for us. And there are times I can get very emotional about the particular statistics or people or situations because it is that kind of event. When persons did something that was so systematic, so widespread in terms of collaboration, and so brutal, and then so efficient in killing so many persons in a relatively brief period of time. And one thing I've tried to say to you, and I'll say it tonight, and I'll say it several times again, whenever we reduce human beings to a status of being less than human, however and wherever we do that, we open ourselves up to being prepared to do very bad things to them. So when you hear words, I'm going to say tomorrow at the lecture at Lander University that the Holocaust did not begin with the gas chambers. The Holocaust began with words. Words. Negative words about people. Demeaning words about people. People, exclusive words about people, condemnatory words about people, and those words then led to the gas chambers. So thanks to all of you for coming and for being willing to take on a study and some reflections on what is often understood as the quintessence of evil, the supreme example of what <coughs> sin can lead to. Now, I know some of you are also at the talk at Montague's restaurant on Wednesday at noon, and that was called Heroes of the Holocaust. I'm going to prepare you, because I see a few of you here. There is a little bit of an overlap, because the Heroes of the Holocaust saved Jews. Part of what I'm going to say tonight about the church in terms of defiance and also compliance means that some Christian folks saved Jews. So some of the heroes of the Holocaust were indeed Christian individuals. So there'll be a little bit of overlap, and I want to prepare you for that. But the last thing I'll say in terms of this long introduction is that we're about halfway complete with our series. We've talked about the events of the Holocaust, that is, the events that led to the event, the Holocaust, 
We've talked about heroes of the Holocaust. We've talked about the longest hatred, anti-Semitism. We've talked about the perpetrators, Hitler's henchmen, what they did and why they did it. Tonight, then, we talk about the role of the church in terms of defiance and also <laughs> compliance. Tomorrow, for those of you who are available, there's a lecture at Lander University at 3.30 in, it's Carnell, is that correct, Ashley? Carnell Learning Center, room 300. And that is really a formal lecture. I've prepared it and I've been careful to keep myself to the time that Lander University so graciously offered. And I wanted to get all my quotes exactly correct, so that's a formal lecture. And I don't know whether that's going to be videotaped at all, but it, it will be, says Andrew. Um, if somehow you don't have access to that, because it is a set of prepared remarks that I've written out, I'd be willing to give you a copy of the lecture if you can get there. Then on Sunday, we're going to talk about the victims. I'm going to talk about Anna Frank. I love saying that in Dutch. I don't get to use Dutch very often at all. But so Anna Frank or Anne Frank, and then some other victims. So she'll be one of the victims about whom I speak, and then there will be a discussion of other persons who are also victimized for the chief reason that they were who they were. They, they, they were who they were. And for that, the result, unfortunately, was death. So 10 to 11 and a half million people killed in total. Six million of them were Jews. And as Elie Wiesel once said, not all Jews were victims but all Jews were victims, right? Not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were victims. And then next Wednesday night, a week from tonight, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about why resist? Why resist in the face of power and evil and malevolent intent? Why put your life on the line saving Jews? Well, there's been a lot of research done. I shouldn't say a lot. There's been some significant research that needs to be more done by a person named Eva Fogelman, and she has investigated why it was that persons put their life on the line to save people who were not like them, except they were human beings. And you're going to discover at that talk a week from tonight that a lot of folks who responded by saying we put our life on the line is that these were human beings. What, what else could we do? And there's a little village I'm going to talk about later tonight called uh, Le chambon sur ligne a little French village in uh, south central France that saved 5,000 Jews. And when they interviewed them several years ago, the, the persons who were there were just perplexed. They said, why are you coming to interview us? But we didn't do anything. Well, why did you do this? Well, well, it was just the right thing to do. Well, why was the right thing to do? Well, well we don't just the right thing to do. These were human beings. And they said, we're, we're not really heroes. We're just persons who responded to human need. To human need. So we'll do that a week from tonight. And then finally, at long last, if I can keep all these presentations straight in my own head, not to mention you keeping them straight in yours, I'll talk about lessons to be learned. What can we come up with? What are the takeaways from studying this particular event? What can we learn? We'll see how that goes on Sunday, February 5th. So, having completed all those words, and now you're very tired, you probably need some more iced tea, you need another bit of ice cream, and you need some of that good uh, pineapple cake. Let's go ahead and begin. Tonight, the role of the church, defiance and compliance. Well, as a person of the church, as a person who attends church here, as a member of the clergy, and as a religion professor, retired now, let me just say, there was a lot of compliance. Most churches and most Christians went along with Hitler and the rise of Nazi socialism. Not much defiance. And there you can see 
Nazis around the priests at the church, and they're all giving, indeed, the Nazi salute. Well, why was that? Why did, why was there so much compliance and not really enough defiance? Well, a number of reasons. Hitler wanted to use the church to accomplish his purposes. So one way of doing that was to offer pastors and priests money if you're willing to endorse him as the new messiah, as legitimate Führer, right? Which means leader or Lord. So stipends were given to clergy if they were willing to sign on to Hitler and have banners, the Nazi symbol and so forth, uh, displayed in their churches and outside. And so some of the large churches in different places throughout Germany had a large Nazi flag that would hang outside of the church. So there was an economic reward for doing that. There was political punishment also if you didn't do that. And if you spoke out, that is if you did not remain supportive or at the very least neutral, then you could be put away. They came and they got you. And the concentration camp Dachau, about 30 miles outside of uh, Munich, was a place where priests and pastors were sent who, who disobeyed, who uh, misbehaved, and said bad things, that would be negative things, critical things about Hitler. Well, there are other things going on too. One reason that Jews were looked at in a very negative way was that Hitler encouraged theologians to describe Jesus in ways that distanced him from his Jewish ethnicity and from his Jewish religion. And these particular theologians were pretty adept at portraying Jesus as white, Blonde hair, blue dot, blue eyed. He certainly wasn't Jewish from their perspective. He was an Aryan, right? He was the exemplar of Aryan uh, magnificence, with uh, blue eyes, blonde hair, pale skin, and he criticized often the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And you can find that in certain texts in the Bible. However, that was a family squabble. Christianity was really one group among many. Well, actually, I shouldn't say Christianity. I should say the Christian movement or the way or the Jesus movement was just one part of Judaism in the first century. Christianity didn't become a religion in its own right until the end of the first century. So you had the Essenes, you had the Zealots, you had the uh, Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, and you had the Jesus movement. So it was a family squabble. And so when he says... Uh, uh, scribes and Pharisees, you are like whitewashed tombs. You appear beautiful on the outside, but inside you are full of all ugliness and bones. Well, that's a family squabble. It's like my family at Thanksgiving, <laughs> with their different athletic loyalties, and certainly their different political affiliations. <laughs> well, one of my children loathes a certain former president of the United States, and one of my children loves him. Mm. Oh, wow. Pretty exciting during that. <laughs> but yet, it's the same family, right? It's not the Hatfields and the McCoys, it's the Keynes, right? The Keynes arguing about politics. So, for that reason. And I guess maybe the final reason would be there was this sense that things were so bad in Germany. And Hitler articulated a vision that was going to be so positive and so attractive that he was a messianic kind of figure. He was going to save us. He was our redeemer. Prayers were offered to him and about him. I'll say more about that at the lecture tomorrow at Lander University. But prayers before dinner and prayers after dinner praised Hitler as the redeemer. Praised Hitler as the Lord, as the Fuhrer. Praised Hitler as the one who is our Savior. So for those reasons, not much defiance, lots of compliance. But 
This is a slide that I showed in the talk at Montague's restaurant on Wednesday at noon. If you look on the left, everybody's doing the Nazi salute, if you can see that, right? But there's one guy, and I circled him on the left side, and I blew it up on the right-hand side, who's just simply standing there with his arms folded, going, yeah, right. Uh -huh. So, there was indeed defiance. One aspect of defiance that I'll quickly point out to you, I'll say more about this next Sunday, is simply the hiding of Anna Frank. You know the story. Her family moved from their residence in Germany. When Hitler rose to power in 1933, they moved to Amsterdam because the Dutch were always very tolerant and very accepting of people. It was certainly the way, that was the way it was when I was a student there way back when in the late Middle Ages when I was a student at Leiden University. I think the year was 1066, the Normans had just conquered England. Um, so the Dutch have always been very tolerant, very open. Lots of people would flee there for political freedom and also for religious freedom. So they went to uh, Prinzengracht 263, that is Prinzengracht 263 in Amsterdam, and they thought they were safe. Somebody asked me, well, gee, weren't, weren't, weren't they, no, they were not safe because Germany took over Luxembourg, Belgium, France, and the Netherlands all within six weeks, and so suddenly what was safe was not safe several years later. When uh, Otto Frank, Anna's dad, and uh, her older sister uh, Margot, or Marquot, were summoned by the local Gestapo, they knew this was not going to be a good situation. And so that's when they went into hiding. And they hid in the building there on the right, and I know that Bill and Linda are headed there in a few weeks. They have tickets. I was a student there. We just showed up and walked right in. Nowadays, a mile long kind of <laughs> delay to get in, and so they'll see it for themselves. One of the key, uh, key persons who hid them was a Catholic woman named Meek Peace. Uh, she died in 2010. There's Meek at the time that she and some others hid on a Franck and seven others. There were members of the Franck family, but there were also some other folks that were friends of theirs. There was a, a dentist in town and so forth. So altogether, eight people hid. There she is on the left, and there she is shortly before her death. And I'll never forget when people ask her, well, why did you do that? She said, I'm not a hero. I simply stand in line of a whole bunch of people who hid Jews. And it is true that a number of persons in the Netherlands did hide Jews. Somebody mentioned to me, I think it was after the talk, maybe it was after the talk, last Wednesday, that uh, they, they knew of Corrie ten Boom. You say Corrie ten Boom in English, but the Dutch is Corrie ten Boom, who also hid persons in her dad's watch shop um, above the street in Harlem, a town in she was still alive when I was a student there, so I had a chance to, to meet her. Oscar Schindler was not an exemplary Christian. He drank too much, he was a womanizer, he had an opportunity to do a good thing, but he also had an advantage doing it, cheap labor, but he saved 1,200 Jews by getting them work permits to work in his factory in Poland. Born a Catholic, I wouldn't want him to marry my daughter, but, but, a person is always more than just their most glaring shortcoming. I've always had that as a rule of thumb. Two, two rules of thumb I've always had in my life. First, no one does no thing for no reason. No one does no thing for no reason. And secondly, a person is always greater than their most noticeable shortcoming. So, he has shortcomings, but he's more than that. And maybe you saw the movie Schindler's List way back, oh my gosh, can it have been 30, almost 30 years ago, I guess it is, uh, where he's portrayed by Liam Neeson. Long movie, it's worth seeing if you've not seen it. Probably worth seeing again if you have as well. So, Oscar Schindler saved 1,200 Jews. 
I mentioned also before Rabbi Wallenberg, who was a Swede, Lutheran by background, and saved 100,000 Jews. And this will be a little bit redundant for some folks that were with me on this past Wednesday. But the way he did it was, he issued Swedish passports to Jews. And then he acquired buildings beyond the Swedish embassy in Budapest. And he called that safe ground as well because that was Swedish ground. So that was an extension of the embassy. So altogether, it's estimated he saved 100,000 Jews. 100,000 Jews. Now, was 100,000 Jews enough? It was a lot. Was it enough? No. But those 100,000 Jews are grateful. There's that great story, if you know the history of science, Lauren Isley was a famous biologist, and he used to get up early uh, when he was vacationing at the coast. And he would find starfish that had washed ashore. And so he would take the starfish and fling them back out into the ocean. And somebody comes by and says, well, Professor Isley, you, you can't save them all. Look at all the other starfish. And he said, but the ones I saved are grateful. <laughs> So it was the case that these persons could not save enough Jews. Six million were killed. One and a half million of that six were children. But the ones that were saved were certainly indeed grateful. This is a very touching story. I make it emotional telling you about it. Father Maximilian Kolbe was a Polish priest and he learned through the Polish underground that his name was on the list to be arrested by the Gestapo. People said, run, get away. But he realized if he did that, his parishioners were going to be put in jeopardy. Because what the Nazis did that was so diabolically clever, let's say, Andrew, that you were a resistor. But you were able to get away. They'd kill your family. They'd kill you. Let's assume that your family was able to get away. They would go to the corner house of the block where you lived and simply drag out everybody in that corner house and shoot them and leave them in the street as a deterrent, as a message regarding other persons who might resist. So Father Kolbe instantly realized if he fled, his parishioners are at risk. So he stayed put. He was arrested, he was put into the concentration camp at Auschwitz, the most notorious and probably the worst of all the concentration camps. And how many concentration camps were there? Hundreds, hundreds of concentration camps. Auschwitz was arguably the worst. One day, one of the prisoners escaped, and the persons that ran the camp, the Schutzstaffel, that is the SS, couldn't find him. And so the commandant from the camp, at the time was uh, Frisch, he came by all of the assembled inmates and he chose at random ten persons. Bob, I'll get you. I'm going to get you, Doc. I'm going to get you. Uh, I'm getting you, girl. And he put them out in front and he said, we're going to shoot all these persons. And one person of the ten said, because he didn't know that probably death at some point was going to be his fate anyway. He said, oh, I, I, I'm a husband. Uh, my, my, my wife is back home. Uh, I, I have children. Uh, spare me, spare me. And of course, they, they weren't going to spare him. This is where it gets emotional. Father Kolbe steps forward. He's not one who's been selected. He says, let me die in this man's place. Let me die in this man's place. The commandant changed his mind, let Father Colby be put as the 10th person. Didn't shoot them, but put them in the starvation bunker. Now, I don't know about you, if I had to choose between slowly dying of starvation or being shot, when you knew that death was going to come to you either way, I think I want to be shot. Now, I don't want any of you to say, gee, Tonight's talk was too long. This guy's really going to get beaten up if not shot. But 
They put them in the starvation bunker. So a number of days go by, six of the ten have died, four are left. And a doctor <laughs> comes in, they see that four have not yet succumbed, and they inject them with a lethal drug to kill them all. The last one killed. Is prisoner 16670? There's that passage in the Gospel of John, right? I think it's the 15th chapter. Correct me, Kyle, if I'm wrong, where it says, whoever gives up his life for a friend. Father, please. Father, please. Okay, I'm composed again. We can move on. Maybe. There we go. The state church in Germany was the church that supported Hitler. I'll say it again. The state church in Germany was the one that supported Hitler with its theologians and its pastors and so forth. But there were some pastors who resisted. One of them was a Swiss guy named Karl Barth. He should be a familiar person for those of us in the Reformed tradition, right? Kyle's already applauding back there. That rascal Barty from Princeton, right? That, that Kyle Height. Um, Karl Barth and a bunch of folks got together and said, you know, the church really ought not to be aligned with any political figure. And worshiping that person as if that person were God, we're not taking any oaths of loyalty to Hitler, and that was required of people in professions like being a doctor, being an attorney, right, and being professors. But we're not going to do that. We're going to gather, and we're going to write up a document that basically says, we think the church should be independent of this kind of political alliance and we're not going to utter oaths of loyalty to Adolf Hitler and we don't like the way he's trying to use the church, that is the state church, for his purposes. Now I'll come back to Martin E. Muller in a second. The theologians at this gathering all take a nap in the afternoon, except for Karl Barth. He stays awake and he writes the Barnum Declaration. The others wake up and they say, gee, this is really pretty good. That may be Karl Barth phoning in from Switzerland. He's long dead, but he's always criticized me for some of my theological points of view. So he's phoning in. And this is what the Barnum Declaration said. And it's really included in the Book of the Confession. Book of Confessions of the PCUSA. And he says, look, the source of revelation is only the word of God, Jesus Christ. Any other possible sources? Earthly powers, for example, will not be accepted. Number two, Jesus Christ is the only Lord of all aspects of personal life. There should be no other authority. Remember that Hitler was calling himself the new Messiah and his self-styled word to describe himself as Fuhrer, which can mean both leader and Lord. Number three, the message and the order of the church should not be influenced by current political convictions. So Nazis back off. The church should not be ruled by a leader, Fuhrer. There is no hierarchy in the church. The state should not fulfill the task of the church and vice versa. State and church are both limited to their own business. So they say, Nazis, keep your nose out of our church business. And lastly, the Barman Declaration rejects the subordination of the church to the state and the subordination of the word and spirit to the church. What that last phrase means, basically, is that the church is independent of the state and even our understanding of Scripture and the, and the, 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 the work and, and the reality of the Holy Spirit is greater than our understanding, right? So what our understanding is, is not really fully the same as the Word itself and the Spirit. Martin Niemöller, who was a pastor in Berlin, started out pro-Nazi. Started out pro-Nazi. He drank the Kool-Aid. He drank the Nazi Kool-Aid, right? And then he started thinking, wait, something's happening here. And his famous statement is this, and you know it. And, and, and for this statement, he sent to uh, Dachau for seven years. 
seven years. He does survive the camp, but he's sent there for seven years. What a powerful statement. Here it goes. First they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the Catholics, and I did not speak out because I was not a Catholic. Then they came for me, and by that time there was no one left to speak out. So, Karl Barth, I, I hit it hard with Barth. Some of my students at Westminster College just say Karl Barth. Those who didn't like him say Karl Barth. But it, indeed it is, sorry Kyle, but it is Karl Barth. <laughs> this particular Catholic guy, Cardinal August Kant von Galen, the Bishop of Munster, gave a sermon in August of 1941 about the T4 program. And you know already from my presentation last Sunday what the T4 program was. And that was a program that had as its design killing persons, children especially, and then adults who had mental and physical challenges. About 100,000 were killed altogether. About 10,000 children and 90,000 adults. And this particular bishop gave a sermon against the T4 program. Known as T4 because T4 was the location of the, uh, the planning, the coordinating office in, uh, in Berlin. He was so powerful that nobody dared challenge him. So they did not throw him into the concentration camp at Dachau. He was able to uh, survive the war. He died a year after the war had ended. But because of his criticism, the T4 program, some people say it was eliminated. That, that's not accurate. It, it was pushed underground, right? But it was severely diminished in terms of the amount of people that it was able to kill. So did he eliminate the killing? No. Did he highly reduce it? The, the answer is yes. So that's August Count von Galen. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that's a familiar name, I think, to a lot of you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor. He resisted Hitler. He went so far as to participate in an assassination plot against Adolf Hitler. If you've seen the movie uh, Valkyrie with Tom Cruise, who plays the part of Lieutenant Colonel, who uh, von Stauffenberg, I think von Stauffenberg was his name, who participated in that plot, who was kind of the key person who put the briefcase with the bomb that injured Hitler but did not kill him. Bonhoeffer argued, and you know, we have the commandment, thou shalt not kill, but, it, but Bonhoeffer said, look, if you see a car that is at the top of a hill and it's running down that hill and it's going to crash into a village below in the valley and kill people and you have an opportunity to stop that car, that juggernaut, that juggernaut, would you not do that? And because the cars in his time had those, those wooden spokes, you know, in the tires, they weren't full metal like the ones today, he basically argued that you would put a log into the wheels to keep that car from causing death. And so he argued, rightly or wrongly, you may be convinced or not convinced by his argument, that that's what he needed to do. He needed to participate in a plot to take out Hitler. And these are some books, in case you want to learn more about Hitler, about uh, Bonhoeffer. He's um, a fan to a lot of people. He's uh, probably one of the most incredible uh, Lutheran theologians of the whole lot, uh, even including uh, Luther and Tillich and some others. But he wrote letters and papers from prison. Those were ideas and thoughts that were smuggled out when he was uh, in prison in Flossenburg. The Cost of Discipleship, uh, Ethics, Life Together, The Psalms, God is in the Manger, and Creation and Fall. Any one of those would be really <coughs> inspiring reading for you, I think. But my favorites are like uh, the letters and papers from prison and the cost of discipleship. I mentioned this person also on Wednesday at Montague's, but his story is so incredible and few people know it and even few people in his native Japan 
know about this. When I was a student in Japan, I would tell stories about Chune Sugihara, and they would say, we don't know about him. And I said, well, he's one of your Japanese heroes. You should know him. Please remember that Japan and Germany were allied together, right, in the Axis powers, right? He finds himself as the Japanese ambassador to Lithuania. And when he goes there, he discovers that a lot of Jews are trying to get out. They're trying to escape death. His background is, he is a Bushido samurai. That is, he is a part of a Japanese cultural religion. But he was also a person who converted to, interestingly enough, Eastern Orthodoxy. His first wife was Russian, interesting enough. She was Russian Orthodox. Say, so Chiune became a Russian Orthodox. So imagine that combination. He's Russian Orthodox, he is Bushido, he is Samurai, he's a practitioner of Shinto, the national religion of Japan, and he's like, I gotta do something. I gotta do something. So what he did, he wrote documents that granted persons passage out of Lithuania to Vladivostok in Russia, in the Soviet Union, which was really over far in the east, passage across the, uh, the, the Soviet Union to end up in Japan. And from Japan, they went to the United States. They went to what would eventually be the territory of Israel. They went to a Dutch island in the Caribbean called Kerako, right? So he did 6,000 of these documents. Now, as a person who was a student in Japan, and because I'm not as dumb as I look, when I had the opportunity to write my dissertation in English versus writing it in Japanese, I wrote it in English. Do you know how long it takes to write those Japanese characters? I graduated 35 years ago. I'd still be writing that dissertation if I were trying to do that now, right? So he did that, and he was reassigned, and as he was heading to the train station, he was writing those documents and throwing them out the window of of the car, when he arrived at the train station, he's sitting waiting for the train, he's still riding them. He gets onto the train, he's riding them. Finally, he just throws everything he has out there, and the people who say to him, very special words, Shigune, we will not forget you. We will not forget you. He wrote those documents 18 to 20 hours every single day for the time he was the Japanese ambassador to Lithuania. His wife, uh, Yukiko, who just died about uh, 15 years ago, uh, wrote a book, and it's a wonderful book if you want to read more about this. It's called Visas for Life. It's available in English, thank God, and it's called Visas for Life. The story of Chiune and Yukiko Sugihara saved 6,000 Jews in Lithuania. All I can say is, Domo Arakato, thank you very much. Couple of bishops, couple of bishops from Romania and Bulgaria. My, my goodness gracious, Bishop Kirill on the left and Bishop Stefan on the right. No one knows their story as well, but when I was visiting that part of the world, I worshipped in those congregations, and here's what I learned. First off, Bulgaria is an ally of Germany, and Kirill, who is the, uh, the, the bishop or metropolitan is the word they use in the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, he basically says, look, if, if you're taking the Jews away in, in, in trains from Plovdiv, uh, hmm, you have to run me over and he laid down on the tracks in front of the train. And the respect for him was so high, guess what, the train, the train didn't leave. And Bishop Stefan uh, of Sophia, remember that movie, uh, Sophie's Choice with Meryl Streep? Oh, powerful, powerful, powerful film. You need to see that if you haven't seen it. If you've seen it already, watch it again. You know that in that movie, Sophie has a choice. Which one of her children is she going to give up? because one's going to live and one's going to die in terms of the concentration camp. So it's Sophie's choice. I always thought, this is really Sophia's choice because Bishop Stefan 
jumped into the cattle cars that were going to transport the Jews and basically said, you take them, you take me, na 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 and they backed off. They backed off. Now, in some situations, they probably just take them out and shot them, right? But in that situation, a bishop, a metropolitan in uh, Bulgaria, and for that matter, the Romania and some other countries as well, um, had a certain amount of power. And so these persons, um, they were not messed with. I mentioned before the little village of Le Chambon, Slovenia, in uh, the, the, the southern part of France. There are 5,000 people that live in Le Chambon, Slovenia, and they save 5,000 Jews. One of them was a guy named Pierre um, Sauvage. Pierre Sauvage. He was born there. His family was saved by the Jews of this little community, and he was born there. So in the late 90s, he went back and he interviewed them. And the title of the documentary is Weapons of the Spirit. Weapons of the Spirit. Because what they did, they, these people, they said, our, our spiritual lives following Jesus require us to rescue Jews. So the title of the documentary is Weapons of the Spirit. So they say 5,000 Jews. 5,000 Jews. That they knew what it was like to be persecuted because they were Protestants. And what's the major Christian branch in <coughs> France? What's one of the Protestants? So they knew what it was to be persecuted. So they saved the persecuted ones themselves, the Chambonais being persecuted themselves. And the pastor of the church, famous guy, Andre Trocne, and his wife, Magda. And every time he walked inside that church, I've actually been inside of it, it basically says, um, I am my brother's keeper. I am my brother's keeper. God would say today, I am my sister's keeper too. I am my brother's and sister's keeper. And they believe that. Well, I want to allow some time for conversation, so I'll let this be the, the last slide. I've shared this slide before in a previous presentation, but to me it, it, it has a, uh, an element of wisdom in it, and it's from the Jewish Talmud. The, the, the Talmud is a collection of 13, 14, 15 volumes of commentary by rabbis, and it's to help you understand what the commandments of the Torah really mean and how you should be able to live them out. So there are 613 commandments in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So it's the 10, but 603 more. And the Talmud talks about how you ought to live that out. And so the Talmud says, a person who saves one life saves the whole world. A person who saves one life saves the whole world. I could say more, and more deserves to be said, but you know me well enough to remember that I enjoy talking with you and trying to answer some questions you might have. So, Formal presentation ends, questions and discussion can begin. Please, a couple of hands went immediately up, so fire away. Germany was, was, Germany was demolished economically <laughs> after the First World War. Where did Hitler get the money for all the weaponry and taking off people? Where did that money come from? Okay, did you hear the question? She said, Germany was economically devastated after the First World War. Where did Hitler get the money? When he rose to power, he controlled the banks. And he controlled the economy. <clears throat> and he was able to siphon that money off for his own purposes. Plus, the Nazi party, although it only got about mm, 34, 35% of the ballot in 1932, it, it, grew, it grew in power. And people contributed. People contributed the money. Now, was everybody a Nazi in Germany? No, but the majority was. And so they were willing to contribute to what they thought was, and think about it, the saving of the country. Th things had gotten so bad, and what Hitler said seemed to be so promising, so hopeful, so achievable, that people were able to give sacrificially. You got a lot of Jewish money too, right? Uh, Bob just said uh, Jewish money as well, that's right. Because when you kicked out Jews, the 
the remnant of what they had, which is most of what they had, still in their apartments, right, in their houses, and then they also had bank accounts. Uh, and, and, and as I, if you want to ask a question too, but let me let me say something more about what, what Boston is. When I lived in Indianapolis and taught at the university there, we had some attorneys who were trying to get the bank accounts of Jews that were still left over from this time period because the banks in Switzerland, and a lot of Jews sent the money to Switzerland, they thought it would be safe there, those banks were requiring a death certificate in order to release the funds. These are Swiss banks, and Switzerland, of course, was neutral during the Second World War. So these attorneys in Indianapolis, this was like 12, 13 years ago, were suing the Swiss banks to get that money released to the descendants of persons who were killed by the Holocaust. Because how are you getting a death certificate from the concentration camps? <laughs> they kept records, but no death certificate. So how are you gonna how are you gonna go ahead and force the Swiss banks to, to do that when you didn't have an official coroner's death certificate? You had records like so and so died, and the, but you didn't have a death certificate by the coroner, and that's what they were requiring. So, anyway, you had a question. Thank you for your patience. Oh, great, thank you. How did the village of Le Chambon sur Ligne save 5,000 Jews? They hid them in their homes, in secret compartments. Some of them hid the Jews in barns. Some of the Jews looked Christian. That is, they didn't look typically, stereotypically Jewish. And so they could pass as Christians. What's very interesting to me is, these folks would go to church in Le Chauvel sur Ligne, but the people who were hiding them, who were very devout, fervently devout Christians, would help them celebrate the Jewish holidays during the year in secret. So they would draw the shades, light candles, so there weren't too many lights in there, and help them celebrate Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, right? Pesach, Hanukkah, these kinds of festivals. So they were able to pass some of the Jews off as, as Christians. And then some of them um, lived outside of the village in some houses that were on the periphery. There's been an argument recently in the last 10 years in terms of research done at Le Chambon that there were some Germans who knew that was happening, but they really weren't such thoroughgoing Nazis that they wanted to kill these Jews, and so they kind of looked the other way. Um, also, forgers were important here to have certain documents and ration cards so people could get food. Because think about it, 5,000 people, and you're hiding 5,000 Jews. Now, how are you going to feed them? How are you going to keep them hidden? How do you get clothing for them? And these folks... They did it. They just found a way to do it. And while I'm speaking about that too, in, in my own adopted country, there's a town up in the northern part of Holland that's called uh, Nuveland, New Land. They were a community of 3,000, and they hit 3,000 Jews. I could have mentioned them as well, as well. And both Nuveland, New Land, and Le Chambon Serenia did it for religious reasons. When, when Jews would come into Le Chambon, the message that would be sent out would be, there are more Old Testaments that have arrived. <laughs> there are more Old Testaments that have arrived. And that was the signal that we got more Jews coming. Who's going to take it? You can take another Jew? We know you got three or four in your house, but can you, do, can you do another? Can you do four? And so that would be the signal. More Old Testaments have arrived. There, there's a wonderful book, and then I'll call on you. There's a wonderful book out uh, that was written, and I see the title is Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed. Lest, intimate, Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed. That talks about Le Chambon. So you can see that, or read that, or you can see the documentary uh, Weapons of the Spirit, and it'll put you in touch with Le Chambon. Thank you for waiting. Yeah. I guess, I, well, I don't know that, but I'm sure a lot of people in here, the parents, fought in World War II. Uh, Hitler came to power in 1933, not as Fuhrer, 
but until about the first 1935, I believe it was, she was in Europe. Uh, maybe wrong. At that point, he hadn't killed any Jews, but he was getting ready to. And the United States didn't have their heads in the sand. They knew all about him. They knew exactly what he was going to do. And yet, they didn't help England. They didn't help France, who had been overrun by the Germans. They didn't get in this war until December 7th of 41, when Port Harbor was bombed. And I'm pretty ashamed of that. And I've tried to get over it all my life. Okay, let, let, me, let me try to respond to that. Did, did you hear his statement? He basically said that Hitler rose to power in 1933. That's correct. On January 30th of 1933, he was appointed chancellor, which was really a way of trying to control him. You know, it was kind of like, if we don't get him under our thumb, he can do some bad things out there, right? But we're going to go ahead and put him under our thumb by making him chancellor. Well, the unfortunate thing was, in 1934, the president died. Paul Van Hindenburg died. And so Hitler consolidated the chancellorship with the presidency and thereby got the power. It's not a surprise to me that the Howe concentration camp comes out of that period. And a little bit later, there's a meeting at a conference center in a suburb of Berlin where they are going to come up with the uh, final solution to the Jewish problem, the final solution to the uh, Judenfrage, that is the Jewish question. What you were saying about the United States, I'm critical also. But one of the things I understand is there was an attempt on the United States part to be neutral. To be neutral. And you know, I'll say more about this at the lecture later tomorrow. I guess that's a little bit of a caveat to say, hey, come to the lecture tomorrow if you're free, 3.30 on the Lander <laughs> University campus. But there are lots of people who say, if you remain neutral in the face of oppression, you've actually taken the side of the oppressor. If, if there's a situation of oppression and you remain neutral or you stay silent, you've actually come down on the side of the oppressor. Now, there were ways around that. One of the stories that I told, and then I'll get you in the conversation too. There was one story I told on, and you'll probably remember this too, on, on Wednesday. Um, there was, a, there was a guy, he didn't do it for religious reasons, so I didn't really have him in the church's defiance, but there was an American guy who was really the American Schindler, and his name was Varian Fry. Varian Fry. Um, Harvard graduate, journalist, was in Berlin when the brown shirts were beating up Jews and other people, and he was horrified. Came back to the United States and said, I want to go to France. He was fluent in both German and, and French. And he said, I want to go to France and I want to save Jews because Jews were being rounded up also in, in France. And so he tried to get a passport for the State Department and the State Department refused him. Why? Because the State Department said that would be a violation of our policy to remain neutral. So he got to Marseille in France he saved a couple thousand Jews. And you know how he did it? Through a woman. Eleanor Roosevelt got him his passport. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt. So, what you're saying is, it bothers me too. I understand the political dynamics. I understand the horror of the First World War. And trying to keep us isolated from that, remember the policy was isolationism for a while, and then trying to keep us neutral. <sighs> you keep thinking with something as evil as Hitler, wouldn't you kind of throw your lot in with that? But we know now about Hitler in a way that at the time they were thinking, you know, he just may be this maniacal, oh God, I better not do this politically, Putin-esque, kind of person, right? 
And, and, and so he'll, he'll just fizzle out. A lot of people like to fizzle out. Fizzle out. Now, you were going to jump back in, but, but there was a hand up before yours, so you will forgive me, right? I'm going to go back to you, and then there's a question over here. Yeah. I just wanted to say that silence is acceptance. Silence? It's acceptance. Yes. Remember that famous movie, A Man for All Seasons, the story of Thomas More? Remember that? Silence gives consent. Silence gives consent. I'll say a whole lot more about that tomorrow at Lander University at the end where I'm going to argue you've got to speak up. You've got to speak out. Even if you're not assured of being successful, you've got to speak up and out. Yeah. Indeed, the work there are Nazis sympathize in our in government and prominent people like Lindbergh, Oh, thank you. She said, weren't there Nazi sympathizer on American soil like Charles Lindbergh? And the answer is yes. Yes. There's a wonder, I say wonderful, <laughs> wonderful is not the right word, illustrative photograph of a celebration of the Nazi party. I think it was in New York City. And the hall is absolutely packed with thousands upon thousands of people there. So there were persons who looked at Hitler with favorable eyes, and Charles Lindbergh was one of them. Henry Ford was another one. So on this side of the Atlantic, there was some support for, for, for Hitler. Yeah. Now back to you, okay? And then I'll get somebody else, another voice in that conversation. The only defense I've been able to come up with, and it's helped me through the years, the United States was desperate to, for money. They'd gone through, so if we had a worldwide recession. They hit the United States banking awfully hard, and they were they were trying to stay out of war because it was going to cost money. They were trying to build it up. But they didn't have, we didn't even, didn't spend enough money to even have an army. Our army was in the worst shape it's ever been in, in 1938. And had it not been for this coming up, we would have been sad. We never would have the big power of the world, the economic power. Did, and that built, built did, did you hear his contribution? He basically said, look, there was an economic recession in the United States, as well as everywhere else in the world. And whereas the economic recession in no small way contributed to the rise of Hitler, it also maybe made us a bit hesitant to jump into things because our military was not in a very strong state at that moment. Let's get some other voices into the conversation. Yes, sir. One thing, um, did Churchill, what kind of role did he have pertaining to uh, the Jews, what was taking place? Because he was, when he was out of power in the wilderness, he was trying to warn Great Britain about Hitler. What was his um, kind of role as, as later when he was Prime Minister to try to help Jews? Okay, great question. Thank you for it. The question, if you could not hear it, was, what about Winston Churchill? What was his stance? What was his involvement? What was going on with, with Winston? That's a special question for me because my, my college where I taught before I retired to South Carolina is the place where Winston Churchill gave the famous Iron Curtain speech in March of 1946. So we have a Churchill Museum on the campus and his granddaughter helped to fund bringing a, a cathedral across from London, <laughs> which had been firebombed by the Nazis and then rebuilt on my campus. I wrangled a couple speaking engagements in that place, let me tell you, at the uh, invitation of the chaplain, because what a wonderful place to, to guest preach. People knew what was going on in the camps. You know, it, it, it's kind of like when I tried to interview people from some of the towns where camps were in Germany. And they said, we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know about that. People said that in Dachau, even though the prisoners were dropped off at the train station. When I went to the train station in Dachau, it's right in the center of town, and these persons were then marched out to the concentration camp. So those people knew what was happening. There was also the smell, forgive me, of burning flesh, human flesh, in the air. So people knew. People knew in America. People knew in Great Britain. There had been documents smuggled out. Uh, there had been photographs that were smuggled out. People knew. Why didn't they respond? Why, why didn't they suddenly say, this is atrocious and we're going to... Part of it may have been anti-Semitism. In the sense that 
When things were happening in Rwanda, for God's sake, in 1994, the world knew about that. The United States knew about that. Bill Clinton even said after uh, he was president that one of the worst mistakes, well, I know several mistakes he made, but the mistake he made that he really regretted the most was that he didn't intervene in Rwanda. Why didn't he? Africans sometimes say because black people don't matter as much as white people. Christians don't matter as much. Or excuse me. Jews don't matter as much as Christians. So they do. Why didn't they? Or when people were appealing to bomb the train tracks leading into Auschwitz and Treblinka and Bergen-Belsen and Dachau and Sobibor, and they didn't do that. So why? Some say anti-Semitism. Some say that didn't fit in with certain things that were going on in the war. Some folks said that puts things too much at risk. But you know, I find it in my own life when I should have come out more strongly in speaking about things, there always seemed to be a risk. And if you let the risk be too much, you don't do it. We had a racial incident on my campus and I spoke out and suddenly nigger lover was sprayed on my house because we had an active chapter in the Ku Klux Klan. That was risky business. There have been some other times when I should have spoken out that I didn't. And I didn't because I started thinking, well, there's a lot of risk here. And my Christian faith says you can't keep your mouth shut, but I found a way of rationalizing my silence. And just as it bothers you about the United States neutrality and not jumping in, sometimes I criticize myself for not speaking out as well. So did Churchill know? Did the President of the United States know? Did Charles de Gaulle know? They knew. For whatever reason, they did not respond in a way that would have helped Jews. And, and, and this also, this is also an embarrassing thing. We started restricting immigration of Jews to the United States at the very time they needed that the most. And shiploads of Jews were turned back knowing that they were going, we were sending them to their deaths. So there have to be considerations that people say, for whatever reason, we can't do that. We now later can criticize, but we can also learn from those criticisms and say, okay, if they sent the ships back and they sent persons to their certain death, then what does that say for us when we have people that are seeking political refuge in our country? Do you just automatically send them back? Or do you not? Complicated question regarding immigration. Yeah, Bob, you had a question. How are we doing for time, folks? How's your energy level? You got five more minutes, maybe? Yeah. I, I noticed they've taken away iced tea and caffeine and sugar from your pineapple cake. So I know you're probably running on, on energy vapor right now. But go ahead, Bob. At, at what point? Um... The, the persecution of Jews was taking place. Has Hitler made his move into Poland and all these other places at that point in time? Or how did that come into the, uh, the timing of the war itself? I mean, uh, we really branched out. Okay. Were the Jews persecuted before that time or during the time? Or what was, what was uh, the timing of the war? Great question. Bob's question is, what about the start of the war and the invasion of Poland and how did that mesh in with his, in a sense, his policy regarding the Jews? Here's how it worked. Right before the invasion of Poland, which happened in September of uh, 1939, Hitler gave a speech. And in that speech, he basically said, we will take whatever necessary steps we need to take to subdue the Polish people, including all persons who are undesirables, chiefly the Jews, and we will mercilessly and systematically kill them all. No one criticized Genghis Khan for what he did. And people may remember me for being a killer, but I don't care. The last line of the speech. Who, by the way, remembers the Armenians? Now, who were the Armenians? The first quarter of the 20th century, 
about a third of the population of Armenia, Armenia being the first nation in the world that became Christian, were killed. And his point was, who remembers that? Who remembers that? So most of the Jews that were killed, Bob, were not German Jews. Because Jews in Germany were less than 1%, actually 0.76% of the German population was Jewish when Hitler came to power. When Hitler came to power in 33, 65 and a half million people lived in Germany. Less than half a million were Jewish. So where did most of these Jews come from that were killed? Poland and the Soviet Union, not, not only those places. So by taking on uh, the invasion of Poland and successfully completing that, it exposed Jews who were living there to identification, collection, annihilation. Now, notice the pattern, identification, gotta wear those Jewish stars, collection, ghettos, and then transport to camps where they were exterminated. Okay. So that's where most of the Jews who were killed came from. Jewish, uh, Polish Jews and Soviet Jews. Maybe one, one more question that we need to call a timeout and you need to be liberated. <laughs> well, two hands went up right away. So, okay, we're gonna, Doc, we're gonna do you and then Bill, you get the final word which is really a scary thought for me. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> this is totally unrelated, but what percentage of the German army, which was huge, were actually Germans? Does that sound like a crazy question? Hey, say one more sentence to make sure that I'm following your thought. Well, it, they went in and conquered all of these countries, and all these countries had armies. Did they make those armies submissive to fight for Germany? Oh, thank you, thank you. His question is, when you kind of consider the peoples who are conquered, and, and, and they had armies as well, did those armies kind of get co-opted by the Germans and that increased the numbers? Yes. yes and no. No in the sense that there were some persons who were resistors, but a lot of people got co-opted in because you gotta know which side of the bread is buttered, right? And for example, when Anna Frank and her family are arrested, the leader of the group who arrests them is a, an Austrian um, German speaking person. It's the only reason why Meet Hees gets off from being arrested because she was from Vienna originally and the guy recognized her accent and therefore didn't arrest her. But everybody else in the arresting party were Dutch police and army. So part of it is the kind of thing, you know, who's in power? It's kind of what you were saying. Yes, 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 you're right. There were some people who became underground and resistors, but a lot of people just said, okay, we're a defeated people. How do we somehow survive in the midst of this? And we kind of joined um, to the victor belongs the spoils. And Germany was the victor, so now we'll just simply sign up and cooperate with, with them. But Bill, you get the last, the last I question, sir. So. Uh, more like a statement than a question, but okay. we did visit Poland last year, and we asked two of the members of the Polish Jewish community, they remember, uh, the things they were doing for Ukraine was mind boggling. I mean, it was mind boggling their way to do And the others who were, I think, Baltic states that were taken over by the uh, Russians and taken over by the Germans. They were, but in Poland, I, I believe for that question, Poland would go to war to help the Ukrainian white man. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. But what Bill's saying is that his visit to Poland taught him that the Poles remember. Yeah. The Poles remember. And I'd say as a kind of um, marginal comment, when you read Jewish history, it's just not very easy history to read. <laughs> when you read Polish history, it's the same phenomenon. Polish history is a lot of scars and wounds and pain. So you're right, the, the Poles are not going to 
forget. I'll argue tomorrow at Lambda University, we can't forget either. So my remarks are entitled to remember and respond. We, 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 we can't forget. The other thing I would say to you would be, when you visit the Ukraine, and you visit a place called Bobby Yar, Jews were simply taken out and killed in hundreds in front of graves that had been dug, and they were pushed into the graves, and it was covered over. So when you visit there today, there are just simply mounds of earth, and maybe one big headstone that says X number of Jews were killed. And were, Pope Pius XII was told that. And, and his statement was, and Pope Pius XII was told that. that Pope Pius XII was the pontiff during the Holocaust. And although, to be fair to him, he did some things behind the scenes. He did not take the risks to come out and strongly condemn Hitler and the Nazi movement and protest what was being done to not only Jews, but other people as well, including some of his own Catholic clergy who were protesting, who might not have had the protection of the Bishop of Munster, you know, von Galen, or von Galen, who protested the T4 program. So when Pius IV was considered, how many years ago was it now? Six or seven, I suppose, for sainthood by the Catholic Church, the Jewish community rose up in very loud protest. What was also done under Pope Pius XII's leadership, because he was a virulent anti-communist, he believed that while the Nazis were not so great, a worse threat was the communists. And so they had what were called rat lines that got Nazi uh, persons out of Germany and other occupied places and got them down to South America, chiefly Brazil and also Argentina, not to mention Paraguay. So Pius XII is a very checkered kind of uh, image based on some good things he did and a lot of things he didn't do and then some things that I think are worthy of heavy criticism. Well, we could continue longer. You need to be released or else I'll get in trouble. So I'm going to release this now. If you had a question you could not get asked, I'm going to hang around a little bit and just come up and ask me at that time. Okay. What was the church state of Germany? You said that, that, that